And even today, as our brother continues the study, let us seek God's grace and guidance that we would know and learn more of our blessed Lord. Uh, let us commence this session into the hands of the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this privilege of drawing nigh unto thee through thy dear Son, our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We humbly bow down before you and we worship you. Father, we thank you for the privilege you have given us this morning to be at thy feet and to study and meditate upon the scriptures, the Holy Word of God. Father, we thank you for the person of the Holy Spirit who teaches us and guides us into all truth. Father, we thank you for the grace that has been granted to us through thy Holy Spirit to know the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is God, who took upon himself the human nature and who was manifested in flesh. He came into this world. He died for us. He rose again, and then ascended into the right hand of God the Father. And now he still continues to live as the appearance of, of a man. And soon, one day he will return and he will reign on this earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We humbly bow before him and we give him all the praise and all glory. Father, we pray as we continue this study to know more of our blessed Lord, even as Apostle Paul prayed that I may know him, the uh, power of his resurrection and the sufferings and the glory of his sufferings and be conformed to his death. Father, that we would fear thee and we would walk in your ways. We would love you and serve you with all our heart and mind and soul. So, Father, we pray for thy grace and unction to thy dear servant who would be expounding from the word of God. And as we would continue to gaze upon our blessed Lord, we pray for all our brothers and sisters who have joined Pray, we, we seek thy blessings upon each one of them. And we pray that thou would bless us through the ministry of thy word. Uh, may it be all for thy glory. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We ask this humble prayer in the most exalted name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Over to Brother Thomas Jacob. Good morning, all of you. Warm greetings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord has brought us uh, to a new day, and we are in a new year, 2021. The Lord has been gracious to us, and it is indeed a privilege to be uh, with the saints who organized this Turk uh, program uh, and to minister from God's word. We were looking to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in the past sessions. We are meditating upon uh, his deity and his humanity. And today, uh, I would like to turn your attention <clears throat> to the impeccability of our Lord Jesus Christ and the various moral glories of our Lord as we can gather it from the scripture. I would not be going into much detail, but let us pray that the short meditations we would be having uh, about the impeccability of our Lord Jesus Christ and the moral glories of our Lord would be a blessing to each and every one of us uh, in our Christian life. So let us look to that word impeccability. Uh, we are all familiar with this uh, word. We uh, know that the meaning of that word, impeccable, is incapable of sinning. 
when we say that our lord jesus christ is impeccable we are saying that our lord jesus is incapable of sinning when we look to this truth we have to understand that he did not sin there are many people who accept this truth because it is plainly written in the word of god but there are people who think that he could have sinned but he chose not to sin there are people like that but today we would be looking to this truth and understand that not only that he did no sin but we are going to uh, look to the fact that uh, he was perfectly righteous and holy in the sight of god there is nothing in him that could be enticed by the sin or by satan or by the things of this world so our lord jesus christ not only was sinless in his life he was unable to sin he did not have the capacity to sin our god being holy uh, and lord jesus christ is god himself he is impeccable that means he is not able to sin this is an important truth which we can learn from the uh, sacred scripture uh, i hope our dear brother will be sharing the screen <coughs> uh first of all i would like to turn your attention to the truth of impeccability <coughs> uh, next slide brother. uh next slide brother. okay let us come to the truth of impeccability we know that these three beautiful statements profound statements of the scripture we are familiar with these three statements and uh actually these three statements or these three uh, declarations concerning the person of our lord jesus christ is the basis of this truth that our lord jesus christ is impeccable we know that in first peter first peter chapter 2 and verse 23 we read concerning christ that who did no sin so peter is saying that concerning the lord jesus christ he did no sin peter never said about the, this truth about himself but he said that jesus christ he did no sin now we know that peter is the man of action and he is bringing before us christ as the perfect example and as a perfect example he is saying that he did no sin and in second corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 again it's a familiar verse with this divine nature and the human nature in uh, one glorious unique personality his deity cannot be separated from his humanity and we have discussed about the hypostatic union of our lord jesus christ see we look to the different perspectives of his person like his uh, uh, humanity and his deity but in reality these two natures or the humanity and the deity are inseparable in the lord jesus christ and therefore because of his conception we can say that he was uh, impeccable and the second thing uh, is his private life of 30 years we have only very rare information regarding the private life of our lord jesus christ it was hidden on in our sight but before god it was open it was fully revealed in the presence of god the father and he saw the life of his dear son in this world the 30 years silent years a secret life and he was his, with his parents and during that time our god the father looked to the lord jesus christ and at the threshold of his public ministry god the father gave a beautiful testimony about his son and that is what we read in matthew chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 where we read like this and jesus when he was baptized went up straight away out of the water 
and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That statement Father made because of the wonderful life, the holy life, the impeccable life of the Lord Jesus Christ here during those 30 years. So he was impeccable. his impeccability can be seen in the conception and in the private life. In the temptation, we have just uh, mentioned about it. When we come to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, we are clearly told by the Holy Spirit that we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he was tempted, yet without sin, means sin was not in him, or he did no sin. So his impeccability we can see in that temptation. Then we come to uh, uh, his commitment, his devoted life, uh, we have quoted some references from the Gospel of John, and we have seen uh, how uh, our Lord was a devoted or a consecrated person uh, during his earthly life. John chapter 8 and verse 29, we read that he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do all always those things that please him. So, Lord Jesus Christ was always depending on God the Father. And therefore, we can see that he was impeccable during his life. When we look to the transfiguration, we can say, see how our Lord commented, uh, God the Father commented the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, they, he could say, in comparing him with Moses and Elijah, God the Father said, this is my beloved son. And hear ye him. So we can see the impeccability of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ in these different areas of his life. <clears throat> and let, and uh, let, me, let us come to the next slide where we can see uh, the impeccability of the Lord Jesus Christ and its uh, implication in connection with the, the various doctrines of the Bible. When we look to this truth, we can see that the impeccability of Christ goes well with the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we can see that Christ is God. He is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. And therefore, we can see that uh, his essential nature is unchanged and unchangeable. So if we say that Christ is peccable. That means if we say that Christ could have sinned, then we say that God could sin or God is capable of sinning. But we know that that is not at all true. God is a holy God. He cannot lie. He cannot sin. So our God being holy and he is uh, impeccable, and Jesus Christ, by virtue of being God himself, he is impeccable. So the impeccability upholds the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the present manhood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that today, Jesus Christ is the man in glory. And he has the unchanging nature. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, which we have referred in the beginning. <laughs> he is the same yesterday today and forever and if his nature in heaven today is an impeccable nature that the nature of the lord jesus christ while he was on this world was also impeccable he could not have sinned even then also if he was peccable on earth then even today he is peccable but we know that that is not the truth then we can see looking to the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ offered himself. It was a voluntary sacrifice. But when we think of sin, we know that sin has brought 
a disease and death into this world. We all are suffering uh, because of the impact of the sin. If sin was not there, then there was no uh, trouble for us. Uh, there was no need for us to fear this coronavirus. So sin brought disease and death. If Christ could have sinned, then he could have been sick. And it could lead him to death. But we know that death had no claim on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ could say <coughs> like, the, <coughs> like this in John chapter 10 and verses 17 and 18. We are told very clearly that uh, Lord Jesus Christ himself said like this. Uh, Therefore, death my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. So here our Lord is very clearly teaching us that his sacrifice on the cross was a voluntary sacrifice. It was not because of the cruelty of the people, of the Roman soldiers, that our Lord died, but he died voluntarily. He gave up his spirit and he died. Our Lord Jesus Christ, his death on the cross was a voluntary death. And we have various other portions to mention about it, but uh, in this portion which we have read, we can see our Lord saying that uh, uh, no one can take my life, but I lay down it of myself. And I have the authority to take it again. So the, the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave his life and he rose again from the dead. So the Christ's sacrifice was a voluntary sacrifice. Concerning the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the famous writer uh, A.W. Pink made an observation like this. The death of Christ was natural in the sense it was a real death. And he says that his death was an unnatural death in the, se in the sense that it was not a normal death. It is not as we die. It was an abnormal way of dying. And he says that the death of Christ was preternatural, means it was determined beforehand. Not only the time of his death, but the way how he should die, all those things were determined by God way before. And also, he says that his death was supernatural, means it was different from every other death. So it was natural, it was unnatural, it was preternatural, and it was supernatural. He gave his life. Voluntarily, he gave his life. We cannot do that. We don't have the power to give our own lives. But Christ had the authority, had the power over his life to lay down his life and to take it back. And the fourth aspect of the doctrine that can be uh, that is uh, upheld by this uh, impeccability is the substitutionary death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every sacrifice, sacrifice was offered with a lamb that had no blemish. When we look to the Old Testament, often we have the statement uh, that the lamb should be without blemish. If Christ was peccable, then he would not be a right substitution for us. If he has got his own sins to bear, how can he bear our sins? and redeem us. We know that in Psalm 49 and verse 7 we read, uh, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for, uh, uh, for him. There we see that no normal person could redeem his own brother because he himself is a sinner. He himself is worthy of the punishment of the sin. So he is unable to redeem others. 
but concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the lamb without the blemish, and therefore he could uh, deliver us, he could uh, save us. So if our Lord was peccable, then it would have really affected or it would have really devalued the efficacy of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can see that our acceptance before God is because of Christ. If Christ was not impeccable, if Christ was not uh, such a person who was incapable of sinning, then we also do not have any stand before God. How could God accept us? So God has accepted us in Christ. And today we are in the presence of God because we are in this impeccable Christ. In 1 John, we have a verse like this, because as he is, so are we in this world. Let us thank God for this impeccable Christ. So the impeccability of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was not able to sin. That is what we were discussing right now. And I would like to move on. And now let us look to the moral glories of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we say uh, that, uh, that word glory, that means it is the displayed excellence. When we say the moral glories of Christ, we mean the displayed excellencies of his character and his conduct. In Psalm 45 and verse 2, we read that he is fairer than the children of men. Song of Songs, chapter 5 and verse 10, we read that he is the chiefest among 10,000. And in the same chapter, verse 16, we read that he is altogether lovely. This is all because of the moral virtues of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his excellent character and conduct while he was in this world. So let us thank God for the moral glories of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can see <coughs> that all moral virtues were in perfect balance in him. There was no unevenness in him like the fine floor in the meal offering. We often have uh, meditated upon the meal offering. And we can see that the floor that was used was fine, extremely fine. There was no unevenness in it. And that speaks of that virtue of the moral glories of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we look to the saints around us, we can see that they, their moral virtues are imbalanced. There would be some virtues more in them and some other virtues lacking in them. Sometimes they would be gracious and faithful, but at the same time, they would be lacking uh, in the truth. Sometimes they were very, uh, very, very uh, adhering to the truth but at the same time, they lack the grace and mercy they need. But when we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can see that he was perfect in every aspect of uh, his moral uh, virtues. We know that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And we can see that as he was in this world, the Holy Spirit was always controlling him. Even while he was on his way to be tempted by the Satan, we can understand that he was directed by the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit. He was driven by the Holy Spirit. He was moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we can see that he was always having all the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit perfectly blended together in him. When we look to the uh, saints, we can see that some of their virtues or their strong points, they may have at some point of time, but at some other point of time, they might have lost it. But it was not so for the Lord Jesus Christ. He 
was the same always. For example, let us think about Moses. He was declared by God as the person who was the meekest of all in the face of the earth. But there was a time he could not control himself. And that led to serious consequences for Moses. So we can see that how our Lord, <coughs> Lord was, uh, uh, was an excellent uh, uh, person in his uh, moral uh, virtues. And let us look to the various aspects uh, of the moral glories of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we can uh, see over here. Uh, there was a statement made by W. E. Vine, and uh, I am not going to uh, going into the details of that statement uh, that was uh, yeah, given in that uh, slide, where a detailed description of the moral glories of the Lord Jesus Christ is given over there. Now let us come to the private life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we have uh, discussed about it uh, in connection with the impeccability of Christ, but let us look to the private life of Christ once again, and we can see that uh, uh, the moral glories of our Lord in that life. <clears throat> when we come to Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, we read like this, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. See, here we can see his growing years in his, uh, in his uh, the, that, uh, young days. We can see that he was growing mentally, physically, and socially. And much more than that, he was growing spiritually. He had the favor of God with him. When we come to the same chapter and verse 46, we can see him sitting in the temple, asking questions and hearing from the, uh, from the doctors over there. And the same chapter, cha verse 49, Luke chapter 2 and verse 49, there we can see him saying, uh, 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 I must be about my father's business. And also in verse 51, we read that he was subject to his parents. What a lovely uh, childhood our Lord had. And it is a good pattern for us all as well. So as we live in this world, uh, let us also seek the things of God. Uh, let us always seek the favor of God. Let us be involved in the business of our heavenly father and also at the same time let us be subject to the parents so those hidden years we can see him in uh, that way then when we come to his baptism we can see the lord jesus christ <coughs> there he had a great intention in his heart most of the people over there they came to john and as they listened to the preaching of John, they repented of their sins. They confessed it before John and they took baptism. But when it was the turn of the Lord Jesus Christ, he did not have any sin to confess. So John was not willing to baptize him. Then Lord Jesus answered him and said like this, suffer it to be so now for, now for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So he allowed him to get baptized. When the Lord said this statement to fulfill, he wanted to fulfill all righteousness. Our Lord, as he was in this world, he was always thinking of the righteousness of God. He was always thinking of those things in the sight, in the perspective of God. Most often we are thinking things, we are looking to the things in a human perspective. We want it to be acceptable and beneficial to the people. There is nothing wrong in, in getting a thing acceptable and beneficial to people, but primarily it should be acceptable to God. It should be, uh, it should be seen in the perspective of God. Then when we come to the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ, Satan was trying his level best to 
to separate him from acting along with God, but he never acted independent of God. Satan wanted him to obey uh, him rather than God, but our Lord, he never obeyed the suggestions of Satan. As we live in this world, to be an obedient, uh, to be an independent child or to be an independent nation, it is a very, uh, very good thing. But as a Christian, we should never be independent of God. We should always depend on him as the Lord Jesus Christ was in this world. When we come to the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, there we can see our Lord, uh, he was involved in cleaning the temple and while he was doing that in john chapter 2 we read that he was concerned with the house of his father john chapter 2 and verse 17 we read that the zeal of thy house hath eaten me up he was always concerned with the house of god he did all those things so that that zeal of the house of God was in him. So he was marked by the zeal. He was marked by the glory of his father. Then as we proceed, we can see uh, during his life, he was a compassionate one. Often we read about his compassion. He was moved with compassion. Not only... <coughs> in one, one area, but in various places we read about his compassion. Then we read about his meekness and his lowliness. He himself said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So our Lord always wanted us to imitate the moral virtues which he displayed in this world. May God enable us to look to Christ and follow him. And also we can see uh, he was weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. He was a person who can be touched with our sorrows. He was not a hard-hearted person, but he was always sympathizing with those who are suffering. And in John chapter 13, we can see he, the Lord Jesus Christ working as a servant. There were times when he spoke as a servant, but in John chapter 13, he, he dressed as a servant and he acted or he worked as a servant. Oh, what a great virtue we can see in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord of all is standing in the midst of his disciples and behaving as a slave. Oh, let us thank God for the moral glories we could gather about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I would like to uh, move further. We can see the moral glories of our Lord while uh, he was suffering. As we look to his sufferings, we can see it. In Mark chapter 14 and verse 36, when we uh, look to the Lord Jesus Christ praying in that garden of Gethsemane, he is looking to the Father and saying, not my will, but thy will. He was submitting himself to the will of the Father. And as the people came to arrest him, we can see the leader of that group, that band, was Judas Iscariot. And as Judas came, Lord Jesus Christ asked him, Friend, oh, what a touching word it is. He knew that this is the betrayer, but he was very willing to call him as friend. In First Peter chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, we can see how our Lord reacted to the sufferings he uh, got from the people. Oh, there was no 
deceit in him. There was no reviling in him. There was no threatening in him. But he was committing all things unto the one who judges righteously. In all these ways we can see the moral greatness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, I would like to turn your attention to the seventh cross, which is really a bouquet of the virtues of our Lord Jesus. We know what all are these seven sayings, <coughs> and there we can see the virtues of our Christ uh, uh, emanating in these sayings. The first saying was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There we can see his forgiving spirit. As he saved that dying thief, we can see his grace working over there. As he gave the charge of his mother to John, his beloved disciples, we can see how he has fulfilled his duty as a son, his honor to his mother. As he was crying from that darkness, Eli, Eli, Lama Shabbatthanai. He was depending on God in that hour of darkness. And as he said, I thirst, he wanted to see the scripture fulfilled in his life. And he said, it is finished. Giving a report to God, his father, that he has completed the task that was given to him his faithfulness in finishing his task. And at last, when he said that, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, we can see his trust in the divine care. But a great and a wonderful virtue we can see in the Lord Jesus Christ, even in that dying moment. In that difficult time also, we are seeing only the virtues of our Lord. There is nothing that is distasteful coming out of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is filled with all these moral glories in his inner core. And therefore, it is radiating even in the difficult hours of his life. As more as he was put into the fire of sufferings, he was giving out an aroma. Aroma of the moral perfection. What a lovely and a great savior we have. It is said that a cup that is filled with sweet water cannot spill bitter water. The sufferings sometimes bring the bitterness in our life out. It is not because that we are sweet and the sufferings or the difficulties, the circumstances brought out the bitterness. But it is because there is bitterness in us. There is sin in us. But when we look to the Lord Jesus Christ, he is a perfect savior. He, there is none like him. Let us also join the heavenly band and Tell him, worthy is the Lamb. Let us thank God for such a Savior, a Redeemer, the one who is our Lord and our, uh, our Bridegroom. And let us love him and live for him. Let us look to the great and the wonder of his person and see how he was filled with grace and truth. And let us also follow him and serve him and worship him. May God bless us with these thoughts. Thank you, brother, for those precious thoughts concerning the impeccability and the moral glories of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, the one who did no sin, who knew no sin, and in, in him is no sin. But we thank God for.